I saw that documentary. The hashtag pandemic has been trending. I've seen celebrities use the hashtag pandemic. Does that define where we are? So we are certainly in a pandemic situation, but I want to make sure people understand pandemic doesn't necessarily mean that it's a severe event. So 2009 H1N1 pandemic, right? Everyone probably remembers that 2009 event. At the end of the day, it was a mild pandemic event. So we only had less than 17,000 Americans that actually died from H1N1. You say only 17,000. To us, that sounds like a lot. And if that one person is someone you know, that staggering number. Absolutely. Why is it, from the medical perspective, only 17,000? So if you look at other actual pandemics, they've had much higher numbers of, you know, fatality. So let's just actually take the 2017 seasonal flu season we had just two years ago. Okay. At the end of that flu season, 81,000 Americans died. And that's obviously, I mean, even one individual dying is a significant sure. number. But we want to make sure people understand that in the coronavirus disease outbreak we're in, we don't know how severe it will get. So we're focusing on, obviously, the 80 plus cases, 80,000 cases and the number of deaths that are being reported. But there's also 30,000 people that have recovered um, from coronavirus disease. So we still don't know if this is a severe event or a mild event, but we do know that about 80% of people that get it are in the mild state. Last night, the CDC confirmed alarming new case of the virus in California. The individual was said to have not traveled and now is diagnosed. Early on, we were being told that these were people who traveled to China and traveled other places. This person says they had not traveled. Does that change the conversation and what medical professionals believe they know about this virus? That is a huge game changer. So in the trajectory of this outbreak here, at least in the United States, this is something we were waiting for. So you've heard, you know, the scientists and CDC state, it's not a matter of if, but when. Yeah. And this one case really now shows how many more cases are out there. And what community transmission means is that they don't have a history of travel to China or potentially coming in contact with somebody that has traveled. So now it's potentially in the community we don't know how many more people are out there. And so it is a significant matter. And what we need to do right away is be able to diagnose these patients right away and do contact tracing. Okay, so I've seen the stories on Amazon that face masks, surgical masks are selling out. I was at a drugstore here, went to go buy some for my family, sold out. And then I woke up to an article that said they don't even work against this virus. What is true, what's not? So there's two different types of masks. There's one that healthcare workers wear. It's called an N95, and it filters art particles in the air with 95 five percent efficacy. The ones that you see generally people wearing out in the streets, it's called a simple mask. It doesn't filter out particles in the air, so it provides very limited protection. So it doesn't work. So it doesn't work in that regard, but it does help in terms of not touching your mucous membranes, because one of the ways you can actually get infected is if you touch a doorknob or a high touch surface that actually is contaminated, and then you touch your face or your, your eyes or your nose, you know, this is a way of obviously getting the infection. And I'm not sure if folks know, but in a typical day, people can actually touch their mucous membranes up to 500 times a day. So touching your, your nose, your mouth, your eyes, you don't even know about it's it. It's subconscious. It's subconscious, exactly. And this is a way of obviously getting infected. So the mask at least helps present, you know, prevent you from touching your nose and your mouth, but not your eyes. So it provides some level of protection, but not the protection that people are thinking it's going to provide. All right, spring break is around the corner, Easter break around the corner. People will be traveling, whether it's by air, bus, train. How concerned should we be as this travel season kicks off? So the situation is very fluid. Every hour, every day, things are changing. Cases are mounting. New countries are reporting cases. So whether a case is not present in the country you're traveling to, that may very well change within the next day or two. So, so how do we how approach this rationally? Do people start canceling trips? What What's the rational way to react to it? So we just need to continue following up with the situation. So right now we want to avoid non-essential travels, travel to areas that have community transmission. But we want to also rely on day-to-day -day public health measures that actually have worked. So if you are traveling to that area for whatever reason, then rely on the actual measures that work. Washing your hands for at least 20 seconds. So singing the happy birthday song twice. You know, those are proven measures. Not touching your mucous membranes. Um, you know, not going to a large gatherings where you think there might be infected individuals. Staying well, how would you know six. if they're infected individuals? I mean, when we say when you go to large gatherings where you think there might be infected, again, the doctor telling me that, sure. my reaction is, okay, I'm at a large gathering now. How would I know that unless so, I'm in a hot zone? Absolutely. So obviously avoiding areas that have community transmission. So if you know that there are, there are cases in community transmission in that area, then you would want to limit the amount of time that you're obviously in uh, those particular areas. So social distancing is extremely important and it has proven to work in all the outbreaks we've responded to.